I think we'll give a few more minutes for our panelists, the remaining panelists to join in, Laura Lott from AAM and Jessica, and then we'll get started. Okay, Laura is on the webinar. So it's uh, 3.02 and I think um, we should get started. So hello everyone, I'm Paula Gengopadia, Deputy Director in the Office of Museum Services uh, at IMLS, welcoming you to today's Realm webinar on COVID and museums. Uh, we want to thank all 700 plus attendees that have pre-registered for this webinar for making time uh, to learn from the scientific findings of the Realm project and also from AAM and your peers who will be joining me in a conversation uh, during the later part of this webinar. IMLS, as many of you know, is the primary source of federal funding for our nation's museums and libraries, but in addition to being the funder, we play a critical role as per our mission to convene and converse with various stakeholders, engage in research, all aim to better inform our constituents. The Realm Project is one such important effort, and we are delighted to engage with our partners from OCLC, Battelle, AAM, and other museum and library associations as well as funders like Mellon, Carnegie, and uh, many of the other cultural organizations. Today's webinar is divided in two parts. Sharon Streams from OCLC will be presenting the first half and will be you know, sharing a pretty comprehensive overview of the findings thus far, especially applicable to the museum sector. The second part of the webinar will focus on a conversation that I'll moderate with Laura Lott from AAM, Kevin Hines from the Carnegie Museums, and Jessica Hickey from the Arizona Science Center. We will discuss the state of affairs as they stand today, best practices, lessons learned, and what more you need um, you know, on behalf of the museum. Uh, we wanted to share with you that the webinar is being recorded, and uh, we will be taking questions uh, in two parts. One, we will pause after Sharon has finished her presentation of part one, and then we will take a second set of questions after we have uh, we are done with the conversation with Laura, Kevin, and Jessica. Please do know that we may not be able to answer all questions, but we have kept that in, in our mind. And the last slide of the presentation has the contact information of all of us, the email addresses, so if your question has not been answered, feel free to write uh, you know, to any of us. I think I have permission from all the panelists here uh, and they'll be delighted to you know, ask, answer your questions. Uh, remember that, you know, like I mentioned, this is an effort on behalf of IMLS, uh, but this effort can only be successful if what we are sharing is helpful for you. But this is in no way uh, you know, it's it's a start of an effort. It will it will continue, and we would like to be informed and educated about your needs, so that we and the steering committee of Realm and IMLS can align uh, the work that's going on. So, without further ado, I would now like to turn it over to Sharon Streams to present the findings of the Realm project. Thanks so much, Paula, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be with you today, and I'm going to be asking um, Daniel to um, drive the slides on my behalf. So let's um, let's go for it. Um, let's go one more. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, you can 
you can see me, so you don't need to see my picture. Um, but uh, I'm I'm here to speak to you wearing um, one of my hats, which is as the Realm Project Director for um, the OCLC, which is a global library technology company. Um, my other um, primary role is Director of Web Junction, um, which is a program that uh, provides free professional development continuing education for library staff across the country and beyond. And so while I've had the privilege of working with um, with libraries and museums on, on certain projects, my experience and knowledge is grounded primarily in the library sector. So I'm really also looking forward to listening and learning from you um, today through your questions and comments. Um, so as Paula mentioned, I'm going to give you an overview of the Realm project. And to start, what is Realm an acronym for? Well, it's for Reopening Archives, Libraries, and Museums. And it's a project that formed out of a research partnership that developed early or this year between um, OCLC and IMLS and the scientific research company Battelle. And this project was devised in the really early days of the COVID pandemic um, and to, to produce unique and original research that's um, directly uh, relevant to how libraries, archives, and museums can handle materials and conduct operations that will help mitigate exposure of COVID-19 to both staff and visitors. So the short URL that's on this slide um, will take you to the hub for the Realm project. So this is a, a website where you can find all the information that I'm touching on today, um, all the results, so both about, about the project and, and the results of the project. We continually add new information to this hub, and we also announce these updates through a mailing list that's dedicated to the Realm project. And so we do encourage you to subscribe to that if you're not already receiving project updates. Um, we issue those just maybe once every two weeks, and um, we have over 10,000 subscribers thus far. You can also follow OCLC, IMLS, and AAM um, all and other organizations to get news and information uh, through social media um, about the project. For those of you on Twitter who wish to surface information related to the project, so you know we'll see it this way too. Use the hashtag um, Realm Project, and um, then that will um, help continue the conversation. Next slide, please. So first, um, this uh, slide captures just a really high level summary of the primary activities that Realm has been conducting over the past eight months. And then I will give some further details about uh, all of these after that. So the project has produced two scientific literature reviews this year and a third one is currently underway. We have had ongoing consultation and engagement with an executive project steering committee, working groups, and other subject matter experts that all have representatives from across um, museums, libraries, archives, both at the individual institution level, the um, group level, and the association level. We have created toolkit resources that are um, intended to make the information, the, the research easy to read, easy to share, um, snapshots that distill um, the sort of more dense um, research findings, um, and also to gather and share illustrative examples from institutions that uh, um, show what those institutions are doing in terms of policies and plannings and operational considerations. Um, and also sharing guidelines that may be created by other organizations um, that are also drawing upon science-based, evidence-based information and that are relevant to um, one of the sectors or, or all of the sectors. Um, we are sharing the project information and the resources um, through that project website that I mentioned, um, but we're also drawing upon a a network of member associations and support organizations that are um, disseminating out to their membership um, as well. So uh, we really rely upon that whole, you know, broader national network. 
And um, of course, so much has been so fast and rapidly changing with, of course, with the pandemic and the response at both the local level and the state and national level that a lot of the project is listening, learning, and adapting along the way. Next slide, please. Um, I think it's, thank you. Okay, so, um, but just a, a couple level sets right bef before I get into more details is um, really to just to say what Realm is doing is providing data to you to help um, us all better understand the virus and um, the project um, is, is saying, you know, please use that data to help inform your um, practices and policies. Um, but what the project is not doing is devising and issuing uh, one size fit all recommendations or guidelines. Um, I think um, most of you, you know, really understand um, that you're so embedded in your communities um, that every institution is different um, and you need to, you're developing policies and practices that work for your local context in good coordination with your local um, experts and public health departments and, and in response to uh, your user community. Next slide, please. Um, that being said, we really understand the enormous strain that um, you have all been under um, as you're striving to make sort of sound, thoughtful decisions in an environment that's really a combination of urgency, complexity, and uncertainty. Um, so with this project, um, it started out as a response to initial concerns um, uh, initially around circulating library collections as well as frequently touched surfaces. Um, at that time, earlier this spring, surface-based and materials-based transmission was considered um, of um, a grave concern. And so the project um, was to really understand more uh, in detailed uh, matter, what is the um, what is going on with their surfaces and how might the institutions adapt to that? We're seeing over the course of the project sort of a change in focus, uh, with less um, concern about materials transmission to other transmission routes too, and we see that um, as we do the literature reviews um, and, of course. Um, you know, track the general conversation. But what this project has been doing is really accumulating scientific knowledge along the way um, and formulating a cumulative um, picture. Because there was such a sense of urgency, we didn't wait and say, okay, we're gonna conduct all the research and ask all the questions and do it thoroughly. And then, you know, a year later issue a report. So what it's been doing is just issuing findings um, just as we have discovered them. Um, so you get, you get um, information immediately, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. Um, so one of the things is to try to string that together into more of a cohesive story. Um, I've, we see this also happening in the, in the news media and in, in the general, you know, there's like one, one study is published and, uh, you know, journalists will latch on to that and it sort of fans a new theory um, that might sound like settled science, but it's, but then something comes out a couple months later that's, you know, adds a different um, twist to things. So um, again, that's that uncertainty and complexity that's in there. Um, also, the project is not trying to cover the entire breadth of the questions and the considerations related to COVID-19, um, but has been more um, focused on a few research questions to um, that to really, you know, be one piece to help your local decision making um, in combination what uh, mm -hmm. is coming out of other, um, you know, public health departments in the CDC and elsewhere. Um, I wanted to just uh, draw attention to a really excellent article that's in the British Medical Journal. Um, it was published earlier this spring. I'll just pop it into chat here. Um, that um, gives a really nice um, overview about this this very situation of how of trying to make well-informed and thoughtful decisions under complex conditions. I mean, you read it, you'll probably recognize yourself in it. And basically, you know, these are experts who've worked. Um, in this 
in in these types of public health crises before and they say um you know you're doing a great job and just recognize that um that it's not possible to just have solid um answers all the time and right away next slide please okay with that i just wanted to talk about um, what's the status of covid19 um, research overall and this is um this is a uh, summary from the first two literature reviews um the the second one which which was published in mid october and i just put a uh, link to where you can find those um, next slide please and um kind of maybe sounds sort of perversely, but I'm going to start with what is not known um, yet. And uh, these are the known unknowns. And, and uh, you hopefully have heard these in other places too, but it is important to bear in mind um, these, these important things that we do not know yet. And one is um, it's not known how much a virus an infected person sheds. So shedding, you know, when they cough or they sneeze or um, through other excretions, um, how many virus particles are coming off them and, um, and at what point in their infectiousness. So um, not known and for other viruses, there's quite um, a significant variation from just a, a very small number of particles to more of the hundreds or thousands. Um, we also don't know whether people are getting infected by touching objects. Um, there have been um, uh, only uh, maybe a couple cases that where objects have been um, more definitively um, determined to be the source or strongly um, considered to be the source. Um, so that's still a, a question mark around that. Um, and then third, um, we don't know how much or how little virus is needed to cause infection. So how much you need to get um, inside your, your bloodstream, your, your lungs or um, air, air, air passages um, in order to get an infection. Next slide, please. Um, so with that backdrop, um, the literature reviews have been driven by three questions. One is how might the virus spread through general operations at your at your museum or libraries or archives? Um, how long does the virus remain active or infectious on surfaces that uh, it's um, sitting on or embedded in? And then how effective are prevention and decontamination measures against um, the virus in those settings and in those situations? So you'll notice that these literature um, questions are focused about the behavior of the virus of SARS-CoV-2 in the environment and not about the disease COVID-19 that results. So not about um, what happens after a person that's been infected um, but more about how the virus is able or is not able to infect somebody and how we can prevent that. Next slide, please. Um, so at the time of the, the mid-October um, literature review, uh, basically where things were was that SARS-CoV-2 is generally understood to spread primarily through uh, virus containing water droplets that are expelled from an infected person from a, a sneeze or coughing or speaking, singing, talking, um, all those things. Um, I think we're all um, now pretty well aware of that. Um, also, uh, but then there's the possibles. Um, so the, the, the most likely or the dominant transmissions are really that direct contact. Infected person is directly or very close to uh, another person and the virus is transmitted through those droplets. Um, aerosol particles, um, there's, there has been growing evidence that those are um, another form of transmission. Um, at the time in, in you know, this fall, um, that was not settled science though. You had um, sort of, a, you had researchers on, on different um, kind of ends of, of, of the um, of that question, um, so we're, we're we call that possible, but not settled yet. Um, and then there's also again on the on the other end are contaminated objects, uh, surfaces, uh, which are also called fomites. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, 
you know, viruses do get uh, transmitted through surfaces. It's just more of a question of whether that's happening and to what degree um, it is for this particular virus. Um, but as the months have gone by, it's considered to be um, definitely not a, you know, a, a dominant form of transmission, but is still possible. Um, other th other forms of transmission are bodily fluids, other excretions, um, and you know from uh, tears, um, urine, that that sort of thing. So um, those are have been studied more as the time's gone by as well. Next slide, please. We also um, are understanding that environmental conditions are a factor, so um, temperature and relative humidity, so uh, higher temperatures um, seem to um, have the, when in high temperatures the virus dies off more, more quickly and conversely in, in colder temperatures it can survive longer. Um, similarly with relative humidity, high relative humidity, um, slows the spread and lower um, does not. Um, there's also things of air quality, other pollutants in there. Um, fresh outdoor air that's clean um, seems to be um, a better environment for reducing uh, risk of transmission. And then of course airflow, so getting, um, you know, being able to uh, recirculate um, air spaces so that uh, that fresh clean air um, is is frequently coming in and replacing contaminated air. Um, at the time, you know, there was still uh, lots of questions underneath uh, about the level of the risk that these various factors have. Um, so it's something like these are ish these are points of concern, but still a lot to be understood about them. Next question. Next slide, please. And on the prevention and, and decontamination tactics, um, there's things that just uh, over and over again show that, that are effective. Um, one is the um, um, practicing physical distancing so that those droplets cannot um, as easily pass from one person to another. Um, hand washing or hand sanitizing to um, mitigate the any possibility of transference from from either a from a from a surface a person um, to one's own um, person um, but then with the other possible excretions I think there's been more um, focus on toilet hygiene also um, to make sure that uh, transmission isn't happening um, through the urine or feces um, and then masks um, or the as the primary form of PPE um, is is really kind of a, a, a something that really covers all of the territory of those possible risk of transmission. Um, of course, not 100%, but uh, really reduces that risk. Um, and again, you know, maximizing fresh air, open spaces, um, it helps with those environmental factors. Then when we get into uh, how do you treat um, spaces or materials that are suspected or known to be contaminated with the virus, that's when you get into um, certain um, surface cleaners and disinfectants that have been um, um, shown to be, uh, to be effective against um, viruses, either SARS-CoV-2 itself or similar viruses. Um, and then to a lesser degree, there's been um, research around certain forms of UV light treatment that in certain situations and used appropriately can also um, decontaminate a uh, surface or space. So that's the literature review. Um, and now I'm gonna move into the talking about the lab testing. So next slide, please. And most of the pictures on these slides are taken from the actual uh, lab um, workers and, and um, research for the round project. So next slide. And the research question that has been driving um, the, the lab testing, uh, where there have been six tests thus far, 
um, is how long does the virus remain active on materials that are commonly found in archives, libraries, and museums? And again, when I say active, that means viable um, or infectious um, or in kind of a not entirely accurate but helpful um, is alive. So um, this is not, uh, uh, so I might use those um, terms interchangeably, um, but hopefully the meaning is, is clear to you. Uh, what we wanted to do with this research question is really to match real world conditions. So for example, of collection items, you know, the the sort of maybe the the easiest method at considered the time was if you just leave something alone, just let it sit there, if you think it's been contaminated, how long um, would it be where you would say it's virus free? Um, uh, if the answer was, you know, more than a than a, a few days or a week, well, then it gets um, the 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 practicality of that becomes um, quickly um, beyond the point of diminishing returns. So uh, quarantining or leaving let things lie um, was offered originally as kind of a relatively pragmatic tactic, um, but it really needs to be considered in the balance in balance with all of the other elements in play. So if you have people coming in your space. You can't say, don't touch anything. Don't touch the banister. Don't touch the walls. Don't touch you know, the interactive displays. Um, or if you have a, a huge number of, of materials that have been handled that you're concerned about, but you don't have any space to store them, that's another consideration. Um, and then finally, you know, it's, it's, a one, it's, it's one question if you have, um, a surge of COVID-19 cases rising in your community um, versus, um, you know, there are occasions when there there is not any um, any um, signs that uh, COVID is not, is active among the people that may be using your facilities. So for those of you who, who may be following this scientific research about uh, the virus, you might be aware that there are two types of tests, and this is in really basic ways. One that a is a test is just detecting presence of viral matter, so little bits of, of virus RNA, um, but it's not really determining whether those virus particles are inactive or active, so are they capable of infection or not. Um, so one test is just looking at presence of virus. The other one is focused on measuring infectious virus particles only. So I just wanna be clear that the Battelle research for the Realm project is using that latter method. So what I'm gonna be showing to you is presence of infectious virus on materials. Next slide, please. Um, so here are pictures of the of uh, one of the tests where they're prepping the materials for the lab. Um, so as I mentioned, there have been six tests um, thus far that have been completed. And in each test, there are five different materials that are tested. And um, what they do is take a sample of each material and cut it into these small um, rectangular coupons. So you can see stacks of the coupons of the various materials that, are that were tested here. Um, and then, then those materials, they, the researchers apply the virus that's uh, suspended in this um, synthetic saliva or fake spit, as it were. So they're applying it on there. So it's sort of simulating, you know, a sneeze from an, a, an infectious person. Um, they sneezed on this material and it got all over it. Um, next slide, please. Then those are um, materials are put into a test chamber, um, either in a stacked or unstacked configuration. So they might be laid out on a rack that looks like cookies drying on a rack, or um, if if it makes more sense of how those that material is used in the real world conditions, it, they could be stacked um, where their surface to surface is squished together, um, so that there's um, not really so that the virus kind of sandwiched between materials and then those um those racks with the coupons are put inside a chamber um, where they can control the temperature um, for the all the tests done to date the temperature was kind of simulating 
let's call standard office temperature, so between 68 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit and relative humidity 30 to 50 percent. Um, this chamber doesn't have outside air air coming in or light, um, so it's kind of a you can consider it like a stagnant um, a stagnant space. Um, and then that's uh, held in a biohazard safety level or level three lab. Um, so these are labs that are designed to be able to work with um, very hazardous um, substances, you know, um, like uh, infectious diseases. Um, Battelle's worked with things, scary things like ricin and anthrax, um, SARS, MERS, um, um, some other um, uh, viruses. And uh, there's only 200 uh, labs in, in the whole country for this. So um, it's very um, uh, particular that they can um, have this infectious virus in this lab. Next slide, please. So then at each um, pre-selected time point for the test, um, the, the test samples are, are removed from the chamber and then they are added to a cell culture. So basically some cells that are um, um, to see if the virus actually kills those cells. So that if it does, that means this is infectious virus. Um, and depending on the level of cellular interaction, um, the researchers use a formula to calculate from that how much infectious virus is present. Um, so they're able to um, track that from that initial um, level that they put on there. I'm just putting another um, link in the in the um, chat there um, that'll take you to the test plan that gives all the gory details about this. Um, but they uh, are able to to measure the amount of infectious virus all the way to the point that it gets to what is called the limit of quantitation. And this is where there there are fewer than 26 particles of virus left on the coupon. After that point, there's not enough for it really to um, show enough interaction with the cell culture. So instead they look it at it under a microscope and just look at each coupon for that day and say, do we see any virus on there or not? And when the answer is no, they do not see it on any of the coupons, then it's considered hitting the limit of detection. So no virus is found at all. Um, next slide, please. So that is the um, process in a nutshell. And now here's an example um, from, uh, let's look at test six, which was the most recent test findings that were published, um, which was on hard surfaces listed here, um, glass, marble, laminate, brass, and powder coated steel. And let's go to the next slide and uh, first show you what this looks like in graph form. So um, each of those are color coded um, lines on the graph and uh, you see that the brass, which is a light blue line and the marble, which is kind of a rust line, um, they dropped all the way down to zero, the limit of detection on day two. Um, and while the others also dropped significantly that day, there was still virus detected until uh, day six. So um, that's what um, Battelle um, presented to, to us in the form of a chart. And if you go to the next slide, um, this is kind of a, the, the friendly, um, easy to, read um, version of that slide uh, that shows the five materials that were tested under Hyde services. And again, that marble and brass, um, no virus found after two days sitting in their little quarantine space. And then for the other three, not after six days. And uh, next slide, please. Um, and then this, um, graph shows all of the materials that have been tested to date and the results um, um, of those same types of tests um, through those six testing rounds. So this kind of gives you a glanceable thing where we have um, in some cases after just one day virus completely gone and then in other cases um, 
after eight days, there was still some virus detected on the surfaces. I'm gonna drop another link in here. Next slide, please. Here are just some snapshots of the toolkit resources that you'll find on the website that encapsulate um, and synthesize some of the things that I just went over about the literature review and about the, the testing. Um, that again, these are all PDFs that you can download, you can share um, with your constituents, with your decision makers, with your um, health departments, um, just as, as, as fodder for your decision making. And next slide, please. And then I just want to end before I turn to questions um, with some things that you can go for more information. Is so again, if you go to the the hub, the 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 Realm website, um, there is one of the main sections is called research. So you'll find um, the research, both the full reports, the testing plan, as well as charts and graphs and um, and, and summaries um, to explain the results. Um, the resources section have the toolkit materials and there's one section that's dedicated to um, museums um, in particular. And as I said, in addition to um, graphics and illustrations of the realm of sponsored research, there are also um, guidelines, illustrative examples that we have um, curated and pulled in that have been created by other organizations or institutions. Um, there's a, a form uh, that you can submit questions to the Realm inbox. It, it'll be either me or my, um, my colleague Kendra who will probably be answering you. Um, we do read those and we do really appreciate your questions. Um, those questions have helped inform uh, an FAQ which you'll also find on the website there. Um, we update those as a new kind of, if there's new thematic questions that come up, but it does answer all of the most frequently asked one. And then again, join that mailing list if you want to get direct news and updates from the project. All right, thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Um, and now we can take some questions. Um, do you want to take a quick look at the question box and maybe take like, five to eight minutes. We are a little tight on time uh, to answer any question that may benefit all the attendees. I am not seeing the questions. Okay. Are there any that, I don't see anything in in the question box okay um, Chat. yeah i have a question for elizabeth uh, from imls do you see any questions coming up that sharon can answer there's a couple questions that have been coming in um, i've posted those for our organizers and panelists in the chat Okay, I see a question. Um, speak a bit more about virus found on a surface versus infectiousness of the virus when found. Um, so um, it's definite. I would say it's it's definitely possible. You know, again, if someone sneezes or coughs on a surface and they are infected with COVID, that it's going to transfer virus particles through that sneeze or cough to the surface that they um, that they uh, splattered on. Just as same as if it was a person, right? A person, an object can receive it. I think what the sort of the big question is. Um, uh, because we don't know how many virus particles it takes for someone to get um, infected, but there's also the the how um, how likely or how possible or how much would it take for someone to then touch that surface 
and then need to, you know, you're not going to get sick just from touching it. Then you have to be able to transfer it, say, you know, to your mouth or to your nose, your eyes, or somehow so it gets inside your body and capable of infection. Um, so the um, the so far with trying to do um, tracing back of of sources of transmissions, it's been uh, there's only uh, um, there are very few cases that have been where where that form of transmission has been found to be the source of it, um, but it's also really hard to trace trace that. So, um, and without knowing both how much an infectious person sheds and how much it takes to infect someone, there's just some of these, you know, those known unknowns get in the way. Um, so what we're doing with the lab testing is kind of showing the lifespan of a virus on surfaces. So it sort of answers the first part is, um, if you get virus on a, on a substance, how long will it sit there and being active? Um, and how quickly does it, you know, does it attenuate or dissipate? Um, what we can't answer yet is, and then if someone touches it with then, then how likely are they going to get infected? Um, and then, okay, boy, now they're, now they're all flying in. <laughs> so, uh, were tests done in live environments? Um, they were done in a laboratory environment. So the, the materials, um, many of the materials were donated from actual institutions. So they came out of either circulating collections or spaces, others were purchased from members, but um, they were infected with um, virus that was grown in a lab and then held in the lab. Um, so it was not going into say like an infected environment and scraping um, off virus from um, spaces. Um, I see a link to an article in the Washington Post. I think it's the one that came out, yeah, just a couple of days ago about um, airborne transmission and, and over cleaning. Yeah, I think um, there's some really, you know, there's some really good, um, you know, discussion about this, about um, the difference between over cleaning and appropriate cleaning. I did think that the article in the Washington Post was sort of a little bit blithely assuming that having people wear masks and wash their hands was just a no-brainer and a given. Um, you know, if everybody did that um, very um, consistently and across the board, I think that that those two things would, would cover a lot of the territory. Um, but, I, but, you know, we understand what we hear from, from the community of museums and libraries is that there isn't 100% adherence. So having some cleaning and disinfection um, tactics um, to, to use in cases where you're concerned that trans, that uh, something may have been contaminated seems appropriate. I don't, I wanna just do a time check because yeah. I know we were running. I think we should take one uh, question and then um, I think we have to move to part two because we don't have too much time left. Um, and I and I will continue. I will put responses in the chat during the part chat. two. That'll be perfect. That'll be perfect. So maybe yeah. it's a good time. Yeah. Do you want to do that now? Absolutely. And move on because we just have half an hour. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Sharon. And I think um, I love seeing the the questions uh, that are coming in the in the question box. Keep them coming. Sharon promises to answer them now, or you know we will answer them later. So at this point, um, let's move on to part two of our webinar. And um, like I mentioned, we have Laura Lott from AAM uh, and Kevin and Jessica. So thank you all for joining. Uh, Laura, I would like to begin with you giving us uh, an update on the state of affairs as they stand now. You have been um, an active partner with IMLS. You're serving on the steering committee of um, you know, the Realm project. You have been in conversations with our director Crosby and I on you know, right from you know, March onwards, and we are doing a lot of communications with you. Um, I want to start by saying a big thank you to what you are doing um, to keep the sector informed 
Uh, so if you can take a few minutes and uh, shed some light on um, where things stand, uh, what are some of the changes you're seeing, what are some of the needs that you're seeing. Um, you also received uh, a CARES Act grant from IMLS, uh, AAM did, so what are your plans for that? So let me turn it over to you and uh, take some time to enlighten us. Thanks, Paula. I appreciate that. Um, those nice comments and and the opportunity to be with all of you today. And I will be really brief because I think the um, how how all of this gets applied in museums is really critical. And I know Kevin and, and Jessica are are uh, have some great information to share. Um, but I, I just want to whenever I'm asked about to talk a little bit about the state of museums these days, I have to start um, with an acknowledgement and about the state of museum people. Um, I know we're talking a lot about science and data and facts and figures, and I won't go into um, you know, all of the ways that we know that this current environment is, um, is impacting uh, the people that work in and make up museums and, and certainly our, our audiences. Uh, I think that I just wanna say the most important thing for you to know is that um, you're not alone. Um, all of us on this webinar, and I know at IMLS, I know Crosby and, and Paula share this, uh, we're deeply grateful for all that you're doing to serve your communities despite uh, these um, uh, unprecedented times. Um, to keep people safe in and around your museums um, and to give people respite and inspiration and information. So thank, thank you for all you do. I wanted to, if you could um, advance the slides for me, that would be great whoever is behind the magic wall doing that. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of um, key points from our recent COVID-19 um, uh, impact survey, uh, which was um, results from over 850 museums uh, across the country. Uh, they answered these questions in October. So since this is a rapidly changing situation, I, I'll add a couple of comments uh, on observations since then. Um, but uh, this was an update to a June survey that we did that got a lot of press with a terrible news that one in three museums was at risk of permanently closing um, due to the financial implications of the current, uh, of the pandemic and, and the closures across the country. Um, the full report is on AAM's website, so I'm just going to cover a couple of key things here. Um, next slide. Uh, our survey uh, confirmed that 98% of museums were closed to the public at some point this year, so this is a widespread impact. And the next slide will show you that 29% uh, remained closed um, uh, even in October, um, so never, never really opened this year. Uh, many children's museums many small spaces that didn't have space for distancing. Um, and of course, this was before the latest round of reclosings of museums in many uh, communities due to the latest spikes in the virus. Um, next slide. Even um, before this latest um, round of reclosings, 40% of the still closed museums did not have an identified date to reopen. Um, and now I suspect that most museums uh, won't be reopening until after the new year or significantly into the new year, um, perhaps when we reach a point where uh, a large percentage of the population is is vaccinated, which means that a, lar a large portion of our field will have been closed for an entire um, year. The next slide um, show, is an attempt to show kind of the precipitous rate of closures last March. Um, this happened really fast, as you all know, um, and the orange line shows how slow and spread out the reopening of museums has been um, across the, the rest of the year. Um, there's a little green line um, that shows that museums had to, some museums ended up having to reclose in June and July when we had that spike, and then their sort of slow reopening over the following months, almost flat um, purple line there. Um, so this is a real moving target, as I said, and um, we will continue to monitor this um, with, you know, um, the latest reclosings and um, hopefully reopenings. Next slide. Um, museums that are uh, open are experiencing on average 35% of their normal attendance. So even those that are reopening are still um, are, are still struggling to, to get folks um, in the doors, even though we have no information that there has ever been a COVID um, outbreak traced to a museum, either among staff or among visitors, which is, which is good news. Um, and I think shows that museums are taking a lot of precautions to keep their spaces uh, super safe for, um, for people. The next slide 
Um, there's a lot of information on the financial implications of all of this, but the major point here, since we're talking about sort of reopening and safety measures, I wanted to point out is that um, uh, museums have spent, uh, you know, significant amounts of money preparing to reopen safely on average about $27,000 and as high as three quarters of a million dollars. Um, so we know that some of the measures are, are pretty expensive. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned up front, uh, about one in three or 29% in the latest survey um, uh, said that there was a significant risk of closing permanently um, or, the, or the museum just didn't know how it would survive. And this is something that AAM is, is first and foremost focused on in our work, both with the um, CARES Act grant that we received and, and all of our other um, work around uh, advocacy and sort of helping museums both to um, uh, make the case that they, uh, that they are in uh, uh, need and need to be supported as well as um, providing resources for museums to look at different ways to reach audiences digitally um, to embrace new audiences. So there's some data out there that shows that 50% of the online audiences that are accessing museums in that new way for them this year have never actually stepped foot in the actual museum. So it's a whole new audience uh, for museums. And, and so we want to um, help to find ways to keep that and build on that. And next slide. Uh, um, my last slide here is that back in March, um, AAM launched a free comprehensive page of resources on our website to help museums navigate these um, impacts of the virus. And this has continued to grow and be updated um, with help from the field uh, along the way. So there are um, a number of reopening checklists, um, the information that Sharon just prevent presented from the Realm Project around best practices for um, Cert cleaning surfaces, uh, sample reopening plans from museums, um, and then other information uh, around the financial implications of the pandemic on museums and looking at different business models and, and fiscal strategies. Um, and really importantly, continuing to um, center equity in our work as museums, even while and especially while we um, manage the implications of the pandemic, which we know are uh, especially um, harming uh, our communities of color. So lots of information there, and I will leave it at that for now, I think. So much, Laura, for sharing, you know, very insightful data. We have also been, um, you know, referencing uh, some of your findings. So now let's move uh, and get some insight from the practitioner's point of view. Uh, Kevin and uh, Jessica, welcome. And I'm going to introduce both of you together so that we again optimize time and not lose uh, any more time in between. Uh, we would love to know from you what you are doing uh, within your institutions, uh, because I'm sure you know these uh, eight nine months have been uh, like all hands on the deck uh, approach and very fast iterative problem solving you know sort of approach. But as you are sharing, uh, along with what you're, what you, along with sharing what you are doing within your institutions, uh, we would really like you to share some of the lessons learned, how you have adapted, you know, what you started with and it didn't work maybe. Uh, so some lessons learned and anything that you have created, um, you know, um, as as you were sort of building and as you were going. Uh, anything that you can share with the sector, you know, through this webinar uh, would really be good because we know that everyone is scrambling. So with that, I turn it over to Kevin uh, for you to first present. Okay, thank you, Paula, and thank you for having me here today. Uh, next slide. After uh, three months of closure, beginning in March, we opened our doors back up in June. Uh, but before we did that, we focused on three primary areas. Um, our staff safety and protocols, visitor safety and protocols, and our building cleaning and safety. Um, we did a lot of work ahead of time drafting policies. Um, we, uh, we implemented the temperature taking, made sure we had PPE available, um, socially distancing everybody, not only in their offices, but when they had to eat setting up plexiglass. The one thing I think that was really helpful to the staff was safety and de-escalation training that um, when we opened back up, 
there was a fair amount of pushback, in particular wearing a uh, face mask. And it did cause uh, friction with visitors. In Pennsylvania, there's a, a requirement that if you have a medical condition, we can't question it. So you can come in. And a lot of people would come in without a mask. And if they didn't have a medical condition, we would have to remove them from the property. And we had to do it a couple of times. So, um, but we really prepared weeks in advance of opening. Next slide. From a visitor standpoint, um, we made it very clear to visitors what they could expect when they would visit. Um, we wanted them to wear masks. We wanted social distancing, um, directional signs. We made sure that there was PPE available, not only for employees, but for visitors. You could have a mask and maybe a strap breaks. Uh, we wanted that to be uh, available. About a week or so ago, and I don't know if you know, in Pennsylvania, they closed down museums this past Saturday. But prior to closing down, uh, we implemented mandatory temperature taking for visitors. Uh, we had not done that from the start, um, but we did implement it. And surprisingly, we only had one person push back. Um, so I think people felt comfortable knowing that. I know the employees felt comfortable knowing we were doing it and actually appreciated it. Next slide, please. Some of these uh, things on this slide may answer questions I saw in the chat room, but we we own 28 buildings over a million square foot under, under roof. Um, so as you can imagine, we really had to have detailed protocol for cleaning daily, weekly, monthly, uh, especially deep cleaning if someone is uh, infected or believed to be infected. Um, we had deep clean. Um, we deep cleaned the touch, the high touch areas with, please don't ask me the technical side of this. I just know what it's called, QT3 or vital oxide misting. Um, but the other questions that I saw being asked were about air filtration. And um, we took this pretty serious because uh, there was an article that came out about airborne uh, infection. So we made sure we had Mervate pre-filters, bag filters, HEPA filters. We spray the filters with an antimicrobial vericide um, periodically, especially when we change them. And then where it was possible, we increased the outside air flow to the museums upwards of 10, 15%. Not as easy in an art museum as it is at a science center, uh, but we did what we could um, to increase that. And then the other thing, and, and Sharon had touched on this, we do ATP testing in high touch areas, which tests for uh, energy molecules, molecules or living uh, cells. It doesn't test for the virus, but it tests for living cells. So if there's something living there, we clean it. Next slide, please. Um, lessons learned. Um, probably we, well, more than likely, we will do visitor temperatures from the get-go. Um, the one thing we learned in taking temperatures with employees was we started out taking temperatures of employees in their cars as they were pulling in. Well, the ambient heat from the car affected the temperature. Learned that real fast. Um, we, we decided to take the behind-the-scenes cleaning and make it visible so that visitors and the employees saw we were doing it because if you don't see it you don't think it's done uh, we separated working groups repurposed areas for lunch rooms and we kept ahead of ppe um, helpful resources and again this may answer one of your questions uh, about the hvac there's a site called ashray and the head of our facilities is the one that uh, suggested that this may seem silly. We actually Googled a lot of higher education uh, institutions. They have a lot of backing, a lot of money, and a lot of ability to come out with white papers on what to do. And in some cases, we used it as backbone. And then we also keep close on trade magazines. Aside from AAM and, and what we're presenting today, there's a lot of information out there uh, on BOMA and IAMFA. 
That's all. Thank you. Excellent. Very, very tangible examples and tips. Thank you so much, Jessica. Sure. Absolutely. Hello. Thank you, everybody. My name is Jessica Chavez, uh, minus what my name says under my uh, picture there, but I'm with Arizona Science Center, and I'm Vice President of Innovative Learning Strategies, which is a little bit different for this uh, webinar. Uh, I was brought in actually just because of the adult education background that I have in working with our um, our facilities and our departments, just really getting them aware of what kind of transition it would be going into reopening. And we actually, in fact, opened twice. Uh, so our first reopening was um, at the end of May. And then we decided there wasn't a, a government order, but we just decided with our board that our numbers were a little bit uncomfortable uh, so that we were going to take a step back, which is where we pivoted with our online virtual platforms. We then opened again uh, in the middle, late June, uh, where we opened to the public, where we had some great learnings from that. So I have some um, high level of what we did and how we transitioned, but a lot of similar things to Kevin as far as our cleaning, our procedures and policies. It took a lot of great minds to get that going. So if you don't mind going to the next slide, I can start with that overview and just how we tackled some of our guests. Uh, in Arizona, it's a little bit different. Uh, we have a mask mandate across the state. Now, uh, what that looks like when people come into our institution varies. Uh, we've seen a lot of interesting things, whether it's uh, a gator mask or a, a regular standard mask, or we've even seen some with a mesh uh, opening <laughs> in the mouth area. So we've had to do a lot of uh, regulating and training our staff as to what that looks like. So uh, I'm just giving you a little tidbit of what the training was and the ongoing training that we do to get our staff on board, as well as to be able to educate the public, uh, because really we are one of the first places to uh, reopen uh, as a, a cultural institution in the state, uh, and some are still actually closed, in fact. Uh, but one was really just everyone getting a baseline of what COVID-19 was. We have four different generations in the workplace who have a different understanding and different uh, depth of how much they read into things. And so really getting everyone aware of COVID-19, what's the baseline verbiage that we're going to be using on staff, as well as being able to share with the public. Uh, part two was our reopening processes and procedures. And that knowing that it's a living document, we have uh, several iterations of what our reopening plan looks like. And as our lawyers contributed, our board contributed, we have a COVID committee uh, that contributes in a daily leadership meeting that actually goes over all of the COVID information to make sure we are staying as current as possible. And then part three, guest interactions and professional best practices. You know, we are a public institution. We have lots of littles um, on our site and how do we show that empathy as we open to the public and still have an inviting place where people can learn and be a model as to what this could look like during the pandemic. So next slide, please. So one of the things we did um, as far as staff was we have daily health screenings. So much like Kevin, we are taking temperatures of our staff uh, each day, but they also fill out a health screening just um, as part of their procedures when they come in, as well as a location tracker. So we know who's on site and off site every day. Um, again, trying to stagger how many people we have on site. And we are at below capacity, uh, as our CEO will say, we are small and scrappy. Uh, so we make sure we spread out accordingly as well. Um, but on top of that, just something that's a little bit different than Kevin, we are not taking temperatures of our guests uh, in Arizona. As you can imagine, walking to our doors varies the temperature a little bit. And so we found that was not something that was really uh, doable for us on our end. So um, definitely adding um, as guests enter, we have security there to just kind of reinforce that we do have a mask policy. We have hand sanitizer waiting with a guest um, experience expert there to greet them, as well as just understanding the safety practices along our ramp as you go down about the pandemic. Next slide, please. All right, and so getting into the guest experiences. So, um, in Arizona, fortunately or unfortunately, as you've probably seen, we have made the news quite a bit uh, for COVID and just our numbers are a little high. So it's been really important to making sure that we educate our guests and we do have a mask mandate. And because we are a, a, a non-essential business, we are very strictly enforcing that. So even um, down to where the CDC would recommend uh, not using gators, uh, you know, maybe or maybe not, we have decided to take a strong stance on not allowing gators. Um, which are just those handkerchiefs that just kind of go up. 
uh, because you actually need double layers and some of our guests were not complying accordingly. We do not allow the just the face shields again because of the transmission. So we do have PPE available uh, for our guests um, in two different sizes, child and adult, uh, depending on what they need. In addition to that, we are providing each guest with a touchless tool as they enter and they pay. So um, some of our exhibits that were had interesting materials that we weren't quite sure uh, what could be cleaned appropriately in a quick manner, we have taken um, away from um, the public at this point. But we have a lot of interactive exhibits that actually really interact with our, our touchless tools. So upon entry, everyone gets a touchless tool and a brief introduction as to how to utilize that. A lot of our signage has changed just to um, educate uh, to keep people safe and aware of the space that they need to adhere to. So having um, occupancy limits on each of our galleries, training our staff if we exceed those occupancy gal you know occupancy uh, areas in our galleries and how to work with the staff, and then also having one-way traffic in our main area. So really just trying to control space in the flow as much as possible. And then we do collect those touchless tools um, upon their exit. They are available for purchase, which has been a popular item, but really ensuring that that is available for them. And I guess um, um, next slide, which is lessons learned, where we have, um, which is a little bit different. So plan, getting different brains in the room. So to really get our, our procedures and policies, it took more than just our operations department. It took uh, me from the learning department. It took our uh, facilities managers really coming together with different eyes to ensure that we're really thinking about everything down to making sure we have photos under our name tags so that they know that we're human under those masks. Uh, just simple things that really made us think about the whole picture, not just um, the day-to-day -day logistics of it. Really troubleshooting daily. So uh, we have a schedule where we have a leader on site each day. So that's one of our leadership teams. So that's really supporting our staff. So they, they see a face to help reinforce mask wearing or just to make sure that we're following procedures with a checklist that we're walking around. So it's a separate role than our usual day-to-day -day role, but something that's really been uh, beneficial to not only our guests, but also our staff. And then having a daily report in our daily leadership meetings as to what's working, what's not, and how do we quickly modify, whether that's just adding more signage or changing our one-way traffic where it makes more sense to use, uh, even down to how do we, when we opened our theaters, how do we actually structure it so we have procedures to keep things clean and spaced out. Um, knowing that there's no going back to normal and that's okay, but how do we pivot and how do we plan for right now, but also look towards the future. And so again, with our safety on um, procedures that we have on site, really mimicking and mirroring that when we do our offsite programming as well. And really knowing that the public looks to us as a model. And so we, we've collected a lot of data and you know, I, I pride ourselves on this, but the worst report is that we've been the, the clean police. Uh, which I will take any day of being the clean police, uh, you know, when you come to visit us because they, they know that they're safe. Um, and so that is kind of just the lessons learned and what we would change. I think having our security to support us and having friendly security has been huge. Uh, really having our staff understand how to interact with the public and to model those safety practices, having visible cleaning crew on staff, making sure on our website we model those types of things. And then last but not least, there's some of the, a couple of the resources we used. I really enjoyed the Realm resources. Next slide, please. Um, the Realm resource was a great for decision-making in libraries. So basically they're opening checklist. If you haven't checked this out, please do, because it was a great way to do a self-check as to where we need to be, um, as well as some other resources like AAM. And our CEO is very big about bringing different resources in to speak to our leadership team or our president's club just so that we're really aware of what's happening in the industry. And I think that's huge because, you know, what's happening in Pittsburgh is a little bit different, but we can be learning from each other. So that's been a really big emphasis. And then our CDC COVID track, tracker, um, even the Arizona one, we are following that down to the minute. So that's been a great resource. And uh, knowing that um, in our situation in Arizona, we might have to make different policies and procedures that our governor may or may not have decided just yet, just to make sure that we're keeping our guests safe and we're being a model of science. I think that's it.
and I did it. <laughs> My, I'm so impressed. You know, you all are like doing so much, but I know that I suggested only four to five slides, but you packed it with information, which I'm sure will be very, very beneficial, uh, practical information. You know, the, one of the goals behind us doing this webinar was really to connect research to practice. And I feel really good as your hostess and moderator. You know, I feel we definitely accomplished that. And I hope the, uh, the attendees would feel that too. Uh, we only have like about six minutes left. Um, but I would like to, um, Dan, if we can, um, uh, yeah, I, I think I'll ask the last broad question to all of you. And it's really a wrap up, you know, for this webinar. Uh, you saw and heard what the Realm project has generated and what's coming up in terms of toolkits and other resources. You shared and heard what others are doing. And Jessica, just like you mentioned, I think one big need is for um, a continuing uh, community of practice, a forum where you know the ideas can be uh, can be exchanged. But my question, my final question for all three of you, and take two minutes. This is rapid fire, right? Um, what are some areas of need for your museums and your communities that the Realm Project or IMLS can address? And I'll repeat it. What are some areas of needs um, you know, face, that, that you are facing as your museum or your community is facing that the Realm Project or IMLS can address? And anyone can go first. And you might want to unmute Sorry. yourself. <laughs> I was muted. Uh, one thing that would be really helpful is a uh, standard calculation of um, the uh, positivity rate because it's confusing to people uh, when, for instance, in Pennsylvania, Allegheny County would measure it one way, the state would measure it another way. And we as a museum would like to have a, a metric by which we could measure and say to people, we will close if this goes to this number, we will open if it, you know, goes down to this number. And it would just be good, and maybe it's impossible to ask Realm to do this, but um, you know, a positivity calculation that would be consistent that everyone uses would be, I think, a great thing for us to have. Thank you, Kevin. Who wants to go, Jessica or Laura? I can go next. Um, I guess, you know, just as a support, just, I mean, the continued re research and data sharing and just, you know, staying as current as possible as, you know, we know science changes. Uh, and so just as much as we can share and just make people aware, I think this was a great opportunity to have a webinar like this and to have this as an ongoing thing would be really beneficial for everybody and to get other institutions involved. Great. That's what I was talking to our communications department that maybe this is a start of a series, right? where we continue the conversations. Thank you, Laura, your last words? Yeah, I, I, a lot of the museum folks that we're talking to are thinking about um, reopening as we think about post-pandemic and what you know, uh, rehabituation we need to do to welcome people back into our um, our spaces and make them feel comfortable there and make them feel compelled to, you know, leave our um, our uh, their comfy couches and and our online um, presence and programs and websites uh, to get back into museum spaces and 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 programming. So we're thinking about that and um, how we can help you know architect that future we want. Okay, great. Um, I know that our next slide was supposed to be Q&A, but we are really running short of time, we just have one minute. Um, I do want Dan to bring up the, uh, the slide with our contact information. Uh, if everyone wants to take down the emails, maybe a quick uh, picture of this slide. And like I mentioned, this, uh, the webinar is being recorded and you will find it on the Realm site or the IMLS sign, a site as soon as they are ready. Uh, but um, maybe if our um, gracious panelists are available for, you know, two, three more minutes, um, let's look at the chat box or the question box and see if we can take maybe just two questions and then I promise we'll wrap it up.
Do we have any questions for our panelists? Paula, I see a question in the chat, and we probably don't have time to delve into this, but around um, uh, research on disinfecting surfaces or reducing transmission in historic house museums. Of course, we know that's a big part of the um, of the field, and I, uh, I I I don't know if there are, are materials specific to that kind of museum that we could include in, you know, future testing. But we'd be open. I know IMLS has sought. Um, you know, advice from museums on what, you know, kinds of materials could be tested and on what conditions. So I think, I think there's an openness to do that if we know what, you know, what we're missing. Is that right? And yeah, and I'll just say, um, from, this is Sharon, is I, I mentioned that question submission form that can also be considered that a comment form. So if the, if the um, commenter would like to just uh, drop a form in there and kind of list again like Laura was saying specific materials or conditions that you're thinking of um, then we can either crosswalk that to research that we already have or it'll just inform our our planning going forward okay I think that's pretty that's a wrap and I just want to thank all of you for participating on this webinar and sharing your expert insight and i would just like to thank all the attendees uh, for you know your time and uh, wishing that everyone's remain safe um, and you know mask up and uh, like maintain the social distancing all the things that we talk about and jessica i loved what you said that the community looks at museums as as role models and and that's a very big responsibility that we have uh, not only you know, um, still, still bringing in that fun and inspiration uh, in these you know times that can be depressing, uh, but also role modeling. So thank you all. It was a pleasure hosting this webinar, and I want to thank IMLS and OCLC and all our partners for doing some really, really important. Work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. Thank you.